Hello, this is Medscape One-on-One. -on -one. I'm Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape, and I'm really delighted to have with me George Church, uh, one of the most noted uh, scientists, engineers, geneticists in the world, and certainly one of the most interesting people in all of biomedicine. So welcome, George. Thank you very much. And George is a professor at Harvard, and he has done an immense amount of things, and we could talk all day. But uh, I just want to get into first maybe a bit of background, because a lot of people in the medical community uh, may not be so familiar with uh, how you kind of came through this thing where you were at Duke and you got um, combined degrees in two years in zoology and chemistry, I guess. And then something happened during your postdoc there where you, they told you forget it or something? Oh, my PhD. I, I, oh, I flunked PhD. out of my PhD and had to go to a lesser university, Harvard. Uh, <laughs> Right. For so, my PhD with Wally Gilbert. Yeah. All right, right. And then you, you actually, uh, at some point, did you, did you ever go back to Duke? Or I've you, been back a few times. Oh, but not, not talks. after you were expelled. That was, okay. okay. Yeah. And then you were at UCSF for a stretch? Yeah, with Gail Martin on embryonic stem cells. Right. Who would have known that would play out like it did. And, yeah. and then uh, back at Harvard since, what? 86. 86. So yeah. quite a long stretch there. Yeah. And right. you've been expanding your right. reach there. You've had, what, the Weiss Institute? Yeah. What does that do? The so the Wiese Institute, biologically Wiese. inspired uh, engineering, um, and it's it's basically uh, innovative and incubator for um, translation into into companies. And you want to be no more as an engineer than a scientist, is that right? I, I think I'm at the overlap of of, of uh, everything from basic all the way out to uh, putting things into societal settings. Yeah. And so uh, what's interesting is you've gotten into so many things over the course of your career, yeah. everything from uh, obviously sequencing the genome and founder of many companies related to that and assisting many companies to uh, synthetic biology. You wrote one of the most uh, extraordinary books, Regenesis. Yeah, and that, that book all the way had, had, a, had a special feature with yeah. the, uh, what, 70 billion copies? Do you want to oh, just? Oh, that's right, yeah. So we... Uh, I, I, this was an experiment I did with my own hands. I say I, I, made, I uh, wrote the book or used a computer program to translate the book into DNA uh, and then read it, made 70 billion copies of it, which is more than the sum of the top 100 books I did, uh, of all time, and then read it out uh, with next gen sequencing. Um, and, and that's now taken on a life of its own. It's become, becoming a real industry. Uh, you think this data storage in DNA will actually take off? Yeah, so we've, we've had funding from Technicolor, and we've been encoding some of their archival uh, uh, movie footage. Uh, and it, it archive, it's a very special application, which is archiving uh, information. It's very challenging to do that for long periods of time um, with changing standards and degrading media. So DNA has a, uh, an amazing record of 700,000 years without particularly good technology, <laughs> uh, and there's no disk drive that's quite in that league yet. And it's pretty striking. Uh, and it's a million times smaller than any other media. So. <laughs> right, right. Well, maybe a future there. Uh, the, and even more likely since you've gotten involved. Yeah. Now, what about then this, um, this whole de-extinction that you've been right. doing where yeah. you're trying to bring back, yeah. of course, uh, extinct yeah. animals? Do you want to just give a little thumbnail about yeah. that? I, I mean, I think uh, in increasingly it's being seen more as co uh, conservation, environmental, ecological, uh, conservation of current ecosystems. As it turns out, they're keystone species that sometimes are missing, and that's definitely true for the tundra, which is one of the biggest ecosystems in the world in Siberia and Canada. And at the same time, the Asian elephants are endangered, so the idea is to extend their range back out to their nearest relative, which is the mammoth, which we happen to have very high quality DNA sequence for this extinct species. So we're basically trying to make cold resistant Asian elephants to save that species and save the carbon that's locked in the tundra. So you think that's going to happen? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know. It, it's it's uh, possible. It's, it's not, we've, I think we've experienced stranger things. Uh, so, I mean, it, 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 yeah, that they, they actually like the cold. They'll play in the snow. Is uh, that right? Yeah, so just getting them from zero to minus 40. And now, that's a little side project? Is that a that hobby? That is definitely a side project. Uh, it, it's uh, it's adequately funded, but it, it, uh, our main work is on 
curing uh, therapies for human diseases. Right, yeah. so we're, we're going to get into that. I'm kind of just setting up that you have a yeah. bunch of things. You, you do need a lot of stimulation, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, I can't Since imagine... I'm narcoleptic, <laughs> I, have a, I need a lot of stimulation. <laughs> I can't imagine you'd ever get bored. I mean, no, that's definitely so not. Yeah. How, how many people work in your lab, in the church lab? Uh, so we have about 100 right now. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. good size, yeah. 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 Um, okay, so now, and I'm not going to say this is the only other thing, but this right. is obviously a, an area of uh, yeah. significant effort, which is in uh, genome editing. Yes. And this, this CRISPR revolution is right. kind of taking us by surprise. Now, you and I having be, are we're pretty close to the same age, and we lived through the uh, Similar yes. uh, conference. Right. Yeah. Maybe you can just refresh what, in the 70s, what was yeah. the big controversy back then? A uh, big controversy back then was we might accidentally... Uh, cause a problem, for example, putting a SC40 cancer gene into an E. coli vector, um, which is a gut bacteria, thereby accidentally causing colon cancer. None of those fears materialized, um, but they were combined with fears that have been around uh, for in vitro fertilization about the same time that even if we didn't make a mistake, we might go off and start devaluing life or something like that, So, um, which also hasn't yet happened. But I think now that we have uh, really powerful ways of engineering human cells, uh, that comes up again. Yeah, so that, of course, was really the, the biggest thing to happen in the whole idea of, of uh, editing, designing babies' genomes back in the 70s. And then kind of fast forward to the last few years yeah. where genome editing has come center stage, right. and you've been a, a principal in that. So right. uh, for those who are not fully initiated, yeah. Can you just describe why this CRISPR thing, which is obviously a natural, but yeah. it's recently discovered, why is that such a big deal? Yeah, so, so our group uh, and others have pursued about 10 different ways of doing genome editing since, well, since I started my lab in 86. Um, this, was, this is the first one that really works well in every species. We have some that work really well in E. coli, um, but won't work in humans. Uh, we have other ones that work in humans, but they're very hard to reprogram, to repurpose for a new gene. This one is, is the easiest, you know, for 60 bucks you can get a kit from a nonprofit, and that plus a regular microbiology lab and you're up and running. Every organism has been tried and it works in. So I think it's mainly kind of more academic excitement. When you get to therapeutics, where you're going to be spending half a billion to a billion dollars on clinical testing, I don't think it's that significant. But then the second feature comes in, which is not just the ease of use, but the efficiency of um, editing. Yeah, so that pinpoint precision, that's what I want to get yeah. to. When you want to you know, yeah. take out uh, an A and, yeah. and you want to go right there, you don't want to have any off-target effects exactly. because it could have uh, right. uh, harmful yeah. consequences. So yeah. how good are we at doing this precision yeah. Editing. So, straight out of the box, uh, with a good computer program predicting where you should do the editing, um, you can get um, error rates down lower than spontaneous mutation rate, meaning that the stuff just hitting you in the air is worse. Um, with the, there's about six new technologies for improving the uh, editing error rate. I mean, it's hard to say exactly why if we're already below spontaneous mutation rate, but those are fa another factor of 1,000. And if you do it from a clonal cell line, like a stem cell line, and you characterize the clone, that's another factor of a million. Mm -hmm. So we are many, many orders of magnitude. Uh, that doesn't mean you, you can't have something go wrong, but it's probably going to be a systems biology error rather than an off-target DNA error. That would be my... It, so you're, you're thinking that the chance of having some untoward consequence like yeah. cancer yeah. downstream years yeah. later is quite unlikely? Uh, as, long as, as long as you use the best practices, uh, you'd really have to hit a tumor suppressor gene, which means you'd have to have off targets there. And since you can test all this stuff in advance, uh, I think... You could be it's safe. It's pretty likely, I, I, unlikely that you're going to get off target. But I think, still think there's kind of systems biology issues where you, you change one thing by any mechanism, by drugs or for gene therapy, and you get some secondary effect, it's, which has nothing to do with DNA. It's yeah. complicated. It is complicated. <laughs> that, I think we need to remind ourselves. And that's why we do clinical trials. And speaking of clinical trials, there are now a number in genome yeah. editing of yes. very rare diseases, and yeah. then you know some that not so rare, like yeah. hemophilia, sickle yeah. cell. Yeah. Uh, you're thinking that it's it, it's ripe, where it's good it's good to get into these clinical trials. 
Yeah, well, there are 2,000 clinical trials for gene therapies in general. There's a tiny subset that are in gene editing so right. far, but 2,000. 17, we'll start seeing the first CRISPR ones going, and then it will probably, that will blow up to be at least as big as the rest of gene therapy. Uh, there are even co more common things in hemophilia and uh, sickle cell, which is uh, infectious disease. So, so there are a couple HIV of, is a uh, big one, right? Uh, and cancer. So there's already in clinical uh, trials uh, the universal CAR T cells um, so that you can um, have anti-cancer. So, well, that baby was saved exactly. by T cell manipulation editing, right? Yeah, so yeah. that was either the first. Using, either using talons or CRISPR for that, Right. That was with talons, but that was the first yeah. time a person's life was saved through this yeah. editing, yeah. right? Yeah. Even though it was ex vivo, I guess, but yeah. very important. Now, uh, there's been lots of controversies with CRISPR. Yeah. Um, one, of course, is instead of clinical trials, which, yeah. as you said, are really going to get going in the next year yeah. or so, there's the controversy regarding uh, editing uh, the embryo, mm -hmm. and there's that would been presumably a clinical trial too. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, clinical trial, but that's kind of different than people yeah. who have a condition you know, that that are all, you know well yeah. beyond uh, having been born. Yeah. You know, this is the unborn, yeah. um, and there's been, of course, a lot of ethical uh, ethicists have risen about this. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think uh, I think there's a tendency to conflate. Uh, the clinical trial and the safety and efficacy testing that all new technologies have, and uh, worries about using it in some way that's that's unlikely to, to be the first set of things to be used. So, for example, um, if if it is restricted to reversing uh, very serious genetic diseases like Tay-Sachs to a normal uh, DNA variant, particular for example in the male sperm. Um, you're not risking embryos. In fact, you could save embryos because the, the alternative is, is typically uh, termination mm -hmm. of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that scenario hasn't been discussed very much. Usually people jump to some scenario that's like 50 years away where we're creating super genius babies. And I just think that uh, you know, we need to get a grip uh, on what is the likely medical pathway. And, and it so, would be very hard to, to refuse parents the option to avoid an abortion and have a, a non tay Sachs family. Whereas um, in the UK, they're yeah. going forward with this, at least uh, with in the research. lab, in the with lab, research. but this has been banned in the U.S., or where, where does it stand in the U.S.? No, actually, it's, it's, it's legal in uh, China, U.S., U.K., and a number of places. Um, it's just um, you need to have private funding in some of these places. Oh, that's but, what I meant by not supported by the government, NIH here in the U.S. Well, it's, di it's different from a ban, but yes. Yeah, it, okay. It, 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 uh, right. <clears throat> Key point. Yeah. For example, embryonic stem cell research was not supported by the government, but it exploded uh, uh, economically um, in California and Massachusetts and a few other places where th $3 billion was committed to it. So that's very far from... No support. That's uh, true. Yeah. Uh, there's In fact, it could have the unintended opposite consequence that if you if you don't support it by NIH, then it's going to be supported privately. It might move more quickly it and might. get even more funding, it as might. we've seen, I guess, yeah. right? So you're, I'm glad you clarified that. So it, it is controversial, though, that yeah. could this start to be used in a way um, which is um, of concern to, yeah. to people. Now, another controversy has been this whole patent dispute, right. which is, I guess, perhaps it's a distraction, but right. it's obviously gotten a lot of media yeah. coverage. Yeah. What's your views about that? I, I don't really think it's a, any more of a distraction than the race for sequencing the human genome. It was like, it's, if it's what gets people's attention, then finally people are paying some attention <laughs> to science. Uh, it's not the way I would have wanted it. Fortunately, I'm not involved directly in the patent uh, dispute so far because our patents on CRISPR are undisputed. Um, so I think that's a good may, part. Yeah. So and, and you've actually uh, is it collaborated with Jennifer Dudna and the group at Berkeley? We, we I, I've worked with. I like well, I like working with her. We never co-authored a paper uh, together. Uh, I have co-authored a lot of papers with Feng Zhang. Yes. Um, but I'm not taking sides. I like <laughs> both sides. So. Well, like when that but, uh, when Eric Lander published this, yeah. uh, the heroes of CRISPR. Yeah. What did you think about that in in Cell a few uh, weeks back? Well, he he actually. Uh, I offered to proofread it for him in advance, but he didn't give me. He only came a few hours before it came out, so. I had to, I uh, but you know, I, I I felt that it was he. 
it was a good idea, which was to like, give more credit, uh, but there was s some uh, bias that other people saw. Uh, I, um, and I think in the end, there wasn't that much credit given to the young people who actually did the work. That was one of my mm -hmm. key mm -hmm. critiques. Yeah. Was, uh, if you're gonna give credit, give the credit to uh, Lu Han Yang and Prashant Mali and Le Kong and, uh, and so on. Yeah, no. Martin great, Jenick, yeah. Great point. Yeah. All right, so we'll see how this plays out, but it's, uh, would you say this is the biggest thing to happen um, in, in decades uh, in medicine, this whole genome editing? I don't need to say that because other people have said it. You, I mean, you're I'll, you're I'll in say, agreement. I'll, I say wait and, wait and see, really, because we have three other technologies that don't make double-strand breaks. Um, and one of the problems with double-strand breaks is there's a side reaction called non-homologous enjoining that is not, is not actually precise editing. It's very imprecise editing. And so I think any, any method that is easily reprogrammed without double strand breaks would be even, even better. Well, so I say wait and see. Well, yeah, yeah but even with the technology that As exists is. today, you uh, just last year published about how you could edit some 60 genes oh, yeah. simultaneously yeah. and bring back the whole idea of xenotransplants. Isn't yes. that right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, we should celebrate where we are <laughs> rather than than me getting ahead of myself. But yeah, so with, with, uh, I think that even with CRISPR, um, it seemed daunting to change more than one gene at a, or two genes at a time. Um, but we took on the 62 um, endogenous retroviruses that had basically set back 15 years ago a billion dollar investment in uh, commitment to transplantation from pigs to humans, which is a really uh, uh, very promising direction. Anyway, so with CRISPR, we could do that in 14 days. I mean, and it's incredible. Yeah, yeah it I is. mean, it's, it's so to think the thought that yeah. because of genome editing that we could actually get in to, to deal with the, the, the massive problem of donors' uh, organs for yeah. transplant is, is really right. Uh, right. striking. Now, where do you go next? You've done so much, yeah. uh, and obviously there, there's, um, it, it's exciting. Uh, yeah. what, what is it that is going to be your, your big push over the years ahead? Uh, I think that... Well, the, the last thing on CRISPR that, that, that we're doing uh, next is uh, engineering wild species it's because a huge fraction of, uh, of our health problems are due to um, vectors, rodent and, and insect vectors, Lyme disease, Zika, malaria, and so forth. Um, but the next next thing has to do with the brain initiative. We help. Oh, I, I I can't yeah. believe I forgot that. Yeah. Of all things, <laughs> so you're working hard on that, the functional yeah. connectome and all right, this exactly. sort of thing. Yeah. So we have a wonderful <laughs> IARPA funding for the doing connecting the brain activity map with the connectome at uh, at synapse level resolution, and turning that into visual machine learning <laughs> algorithms, which which is like the killer application in the internet where you can do you know, driverless cars, uh, Google recognition of images, and so forth. That's far behind where it should be uh, right. due to lack of understanding of how the mammalian visual cortex works. Yeah, no, I, I know your, um, your uh, impact on the brain initiative is gonna be uh, very significant, and I, it's just actually striking how you have all these different bases covered, and you're really making momentous contributions in each. And um, it, it also is a, the sense that there's so much more that can be achieved, right? Yeah. Well, George, this has been a fantastic. Uh, if there is an interesting person in all of biomedicine, it's got to be you. Yeah, you. I, I wish we had even more. I wish we had hours to yeah. chat so the Medscape audience yeah. could hear yeah. about your thoughts and yeah. your um, the things that you think are going to be directions for the future. Yeah. But thanks so much for Thank joining you. us. Yeah. And thanks Great so much uh, for all of you at Medscape. We'll continue to bring along some of the most interesting people in the world of medicine, and certainly uh, that's fulfilled by George Church. Thank you.